Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. There's a theorem of Darboux that says um, at any point in the manifold there are coordinates such that the, the symplectic form just looks like pairing the coordinates. So I have x's and y's, and the uh, symplectic form will take, um, will be sort of delta, uh, chronicle delta ij on xi and yj. So it's dxi wedge dyj. And in particular, that says that in symplectic geometry, there are no local invariants. Everything that you can say is something global. So the standard example is the two sphere. Um, and omega is some choice of area form. There are a lot of choices, and the, the choice is just how, how big do I want my two sphere? Do I want a little one or a big one? And symplectically, those are different. If, as, as manifolds, they're the same, but in the symplectic world, we keep track of how big things are. And so in general, a two-form is just something that's supposed to be some analog of, of area. Um, it really is a two-dimensional measure. Um, that's that. Um, other examples include toric varieties, flag varieties, cohesion orbits. Um, these are all Kähler, which just means that they have a complex structure lying around. Now, on my manifold, my manifolds are very symmetric. So the sphere has this nice rotational symmetry. And that happens more generally. So I'm going to assume that there's a torus acting. And for me, a torus is just a bunch of copies of S1. And that, so for every element of this group, I have um, a diffeomorphism of my manifold. The diffeomorphism should hopefully preserve the symplectic form. And I'll call the action symplectic if it does. Uh, the, the rotation of the sphere does preserve the symplectic form. That We don't change the area if we rotate the sphere. And the action is Hamiltonian if, in addition, it satisfies this sort of technical condition, which looks like it was a little mangled on the screen. Um, but what's going on is that I, I take some vector field. So suppose I just have an S1 action. I can look at the, I can look at the flows of the S1 acting, and I can look at the vector fields, the, the vectors that the flow generates. And I can plug those vectors into the symplectic form. So I had a two form. That's something that's supposed to eat two vectors. I throw in one vector, and I have something that eats only one vector. So I have a one form, and I can ask that that be exact. So that's exactly the condition that the manifold be Hamiltonian. Um, the, the sort of technical bits aside, the point is that these, um, if, the, if the action is Hamiltonian, I have these zero forms, these speak C. And zero forms are just functions. So I have a smooth function from the manifold to R. So that the action be Hamiltonian just just as the requirement that I have these smooth functions called Hamiltonian functions. Sorry? What is C? C is an element of the Lie algebra. So um, if I just had an S1 acting, I, I get these vector fields. And so for every, um, for every sort of sub S1 inside of T, I get one of these vector fields. And those are, um, those are, uh, those those are denoted by or those those can be kept track of by keeping track of elements of the Lie algebra and exponentiating down. So that's exactly what's ha what's happening. I have an element of the Lie algebra. I exponentiate it and I look at the vector field that that circle is generating. Is that reasonably clear? Sure. Sure. So what I really should do is is give you the example more in a in a better way. So this, I'll show you this example on a slide in a minute. But um, the, coming back to our favorite, my favorite example, we have a two sphere. And there's an S1 acting by rotation. So this preserves the, the symplectic form. And it is Hamiltonian. Um, the vector fields that I want to look at, so the Vectors, I'm supposed to I'm supposed to look at the infinitesimal action of this, and so the the vector fields are just vectors along the, the tangent vectors to the flow lines of the of the action. So the flow preserves the latitude lines, and the infinitesimal vector fields, the Hamiltonian vector fields, are just the vectors tangent to the to the latitude lines. Okay, so then um, this 
for this to be Hamiltonian, I'm supposed to plug those vector fields into this symplectic form. Okay, so in this case, if I if I sort of look around here, I said the symplectic form is the area form. So that's supposed to what I what I mean by that is I have a tangent link here. And say so I have two tangent vectors. By area form, I just mean take their um, take the area of the parallelogram that they determine. Uh, signed area. So you know, if I take it, if I take them in one order, I get one area. And if I take them in the other order, I get the negative. Okay, so that's skew symmetric. Now I can locally write out an area form here. If I if I sort of choose local coordinates, I can choose the angle coordinate and the height coordinate. So I can locally have um, I sort of have my my um, the angle at which I'm rotating, or the angle of of the latitude, and then how high I am. So I can locally write. Omega as d theta wedge dz, where theta is the angle coordinate and z is the height. And the vector fields that this S1 generates are just d by d theta. So the Hamiltonian vector field is d by d theta. So when I plug this into my symplectic form, you get dz. And so a moment map for this is going to just be the height function. Okay. So, so I have a bunch of smooth functions, uh, one for every element of the dual of the Lie algebra, and I can put these together, and I actually get a map from the manifold to the dual of the Lie algebra by defining. Well, so I have to tell you, I'm supposed to take phi of p, and I'm supposed to have, um, I'm supposed to have an element of the dual of the Lie algebra. So that means if I plug in an element of the Lie algebra, I'm supposed to get out a real number. And so that pairing is just, I take my, my C component and apply it to P. Okay, so I have a possibly mysterious, but I have some map from P to, from, from the manifold to RM. This map is called the moment map or the momentum map. Um, depending on which coast you come from. And I guess we're in the West Coast, so we should be calling it momentum map. But I learned it on the East Coast, so I call it moment map. Um, and in particular, it's a T-equivariant map. But by equivariant, what I mean is, let's see, so phi goes from M to Rn. Um, here, I know what the T-action is. Here, the T-action is just the, the, the trivial action. Don't do anything. So. When I say the map is equivariant, I just mean it takes a, a whole orbit to the same point. Okay, so here's our um, our height function for the S1 action. Um, perhaps, well, so that is what it is. Um, and the, the first theorem in symplectic geometry that you learn when you learn about Hamiltonian torus actions is you learn something about what the image of the moment map is. So for this, the image is just an interval. Um, it's convex. I guess it sort of has to be because the sphere is connected and we have a smooth function. So of course, it's, the image is going to be an interval. But in general, this is true. Um, it's a theorem of Atiyah, Gilliman, and Sternberg. But if you have a compact connected symplectic manifold, then the image is a convex polytope in Rn. And moreover, it's the convex hull of the images of the fixed points. So um, the image is called the moment polytope. And this is, this is exactly where symplectic geometry joins up with the study of polytopes. And where kind of torque comes into the picture. In that case, n is? In this case, n is 1. So n is the dimension of the torus. And maybe that's the next thing. I mean, really, 
what I should be doing is giving you some more examples of polytopes that show up. So um, that's not my next slide. So I'm going to just draw some examples because that will be sort of useful. So polytopes that show up so I have the interval that's really the only polytope in one dimension and two dimensions um, it turns out that I can get any um, I can get any polygon so I can get any Um, I suppose in, in any dimension, I can just take any set of points and just take their convex hull, and that can be some moment polytope. And it's not particularly, in, particularly interesting to do that. Um, let's see, I'll draw at least one more three-dimensional example. Um, so just knowing a polytope really isn't quite enough to tell you everything that you want to know from the simplex geometry point of view. The point one of the points of studying moment maps is that this polytope or the, the moment map can tell you a lot about the topology of the manifold that you start with. So somehow one of the reasons people are interested in moment polytopes and their combinatorics is because it's supposed to tell you something about topology of the original thing that you started with. Um, in order to, to say something more than, um, in order to say something a little more, we have to think about the internal structure of the polytope. So I'll tell you where that comes from. Okay, so the vertices of the polytope correspond to T fixed points. So we know we're taking a convex hull of the images of the T fixed points. And in fact, I can, there, well, so that's that. The edges of the polytopes correspond to points that are fixed by a codimension one subtorus. So um, if I go back to my original example, so let's see, I have two fixed points and then I have this edge, and that's supposed to be points fixed by codimension one subtorus. Well, inside S1, there's the only codimension one subtorus is something finite or just the identity, and so I get an edge. And more generally, I, I get edges of my polytope um, exactly in those cases. And the vertices and the edges, I mean, when I take a convex hull, I only have the vertices and edges on the, on the exterior, but in fact, there are vertices and edges on the inside. So, for example, here, I probably want to keep track of the fact that I have edges inside. Then I may have vertices inside. And then in general, more generally, the k-faces of the polytope correspond geometrically to points fixed by a codimension k subtorus. So in some sense, the moment polytope, um, by which I really mean the moment polytope with this extra internal structure, is some discrete representation of the orbit space m mod t, on the space of all t orbits. Okay, so some examples. Simple, rational, convex, smooth polytopes in RM. Okay, so simple means that every vertex I have n edges coming out. Rational means the edges are rational. Convex we know. Smooth. Smooth essentially means that we're going to... Um, uh, smooth means that the at, at every vertex the edges, um, the edges that come out are actually a Z basis for the vector space, not just an R basis. Right, so that's a good question. So the question is, why, I mean, if this is really representing the orbit space, why when I have two edges intersecting, is there not a fixed point at their intersection? Um, the point is, so this particular example actually corresponds to a six-dimensional manifold. So I'm actually losing a lot of dimensions when I map down. And so, in fact, back in the original manifold, this edge, the, 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 the points that are actually fixed by that S1, don't, doesn't intersect the points on this edge. So... Um, that's right. They have the same image, but they don't. That's right. 
I mean, so somehow, um, in this particular example, the, the points that are fixed corresponding to this edge where it's, it's, it's some embedded two-sphere, there's some other embedded two-sphere, and those two two-spheres are sort of very far apart. So. Except at the north and south poles. That's right. They actually, they do intersect at the north and south poles, but otherwise they're destroyed. Um, oh, and I, I guess I should have pointed out, I mean, so here um, I have edges that are fixed by, by T. So here I have a whole T3 acting. I have edges, I have points fixed by the whole T3, edges fixed by T2s, and faces that are fixed by S1s. Okay, so the polytopes, of which the tetrahedron and the cube are two examples. So Delzant showed in the 80s, maybe, set 80s, that um, these correspond to complex toric varieties. So from geometry, that's where these are coming from. And th this is, in fact, a one-to-one -one correspondence. So for every, um, for every polytope, there's exactly one toric variety. Um, that's up to translation. Of course, I can move the polytope around, and that doesn't change anything. If I scale the polytope, it's the same polytope, and so the two manifolds are diffeomorphic. The two torque varieties are diffeomorphic, but they have different symplectic forms, so they have different volume. Um, so that's, that's how the symplectic form is showing up. And also, this is how Stanley proved the McMullen conjectures, this using this correspondence. So the McMullen conjectures say something about this F vector associated to a, to a polytope. And you can, what you can show is that the F vector is the same as the set of Betty numbers for the corresponding manifold. And let's see, so the McMullen conjectures say for the F vector, you're supposed to have symmetry. So the um, F0 is supposed to be the same as Fn, F1 is supposed to be the same as Fn minus 1, and so on. That's the same as Poincaré duality in geometry. And then they're supposed to increase up to the middle and then decrease back down. And that's the same as hard left shuts theorem for Kalin manifolds. Okay, so another example is the octahedron. That corresponds to a Grassmannian of two planes in C4. Um, and this has generalizations. Um, we can, one way that we can think of the octahedron is as the cross polytope. For the cross polytope, you take two points, and you add two points, and you connect the edges, and you get a square. Then you take two more points in the third dimension, and you connect them to everything that you have in the middle, and you get the octahedron. Um, you can do this again in fourth dimension and connect to everything. Um, as far as I know, that doesn't come from something in geometry, but um, at some point, so at least some of this theory applies to. But um, I don't know a manifold for which this is a monopolytope. For the octahedron, is but the more generally, the yeah, more generally, the cross polytope. That's right. The octahedron is not simple. So, it's, so the Grassmannian is not a toric variety, but it's yeah, it's some other manifold. So, toric varieties are are from the symplectic point of view, uh, they're they're symplectic manifolds that have torus actions where the torus is exactly half the dimension of the manifold. So, uh, in an octahedron, we have a three torus acting, but the manifold is eight dimensional. So, it's, it's the torus is too small. Um, the other thing that's interesting, oh, it's not simple because it has four vertices, four edges coming out of each vertex. So the polytope's not simple. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the octahedron versus one of these simple polytopes, these simple polytopes don't have any internal structure. They don't have any internal edges. They don't have any internal planes. The octahedron, in, in my, from my point of view, does have internal structure. I do want to keep track of some internal um, facets, it turns out. It turns out that every square is, does correspond to some submanifold that's fixed by a, a two torus. So I do have those, those internal facets. But as, just as in this example, they don't intersect in edges or vertices. So I have, I have three planes slicing this up. Um, but A hypersimplex, oh, right, I was supposed to say that. So the hypersimplex, it's the polytope that corresponds to the Grassmannian of K planes in CN, which doesn't tell you anything. Um, it's the, the vertices of this polytope are, um, correspond to K element subsets of an N element set. 
there's going to be an edge between two vertices if they intersect in exactly k minus 1 um, elements. And so that's sitting inside R n minus 1, I guess. Um, so. And it's, you can see it as some subset of a cube, I think. So, okay, so then uh, next I have commutahedra. These correspond to cohedron orbits of SUN. So for me, the hedron, I take, um, I take some elements in Rn, I take some points, and I just permute all of the entries. And that is going to span some, I take the convex hull of that, that spans some polytope. Um, since, I'm, since I'm just permuting the entries, it's going to land, it's going to live inside a plane um, because the sums of the entries will be constant. So it lives inside one, it, it lives inside a hyperplane that's one dimension lower. So these examples are living, it looks like they're living in R2. These are actually permutahedra for R, for SU3. Okay, and if I choose particularly badly, if all my coordinates are the same, then I'm just going to get one point. If two of the coordinates are equal, then I'm just going to get a triangle. And if the three coordinates are all different, then I'll get a hexagon. And I do have some internal structure. Um, I can also see this as the Bruja graph of um, the symmetric group. And that's related. Yeah. Can you have two? Sure. So the question is, if you have one manifold, can you have different torus actions and therefore different polytopes? And the answer is absolutely. Um, I'm sorry? So if um, the question is, how are the polytopes related? Um, one useful fact, if I um, suppose I look at a torus acting on a manifold, then I have a with a moment map phi from M T star. One thing I might do is look at sub tori of the original tori acting. So suppose S is a subgroup of T still acting on M. Then the moment map, so this say is the T moment map. The S moment map is easy to describe. So the S moment map is just going to be, take the old moment map and compose it with a projection. So since S is inside of T, the Lie algebra of S is inside the Lie algebra of T. And so if I take duals, which I do over here, I get a map from the Lie algebra of the dual of the Lie algebra of T to the dual of the Lie algebra of S. And so I just project. And so that's that moment now. Um, in general, I think it's hard to relate the two moment polytopes. What is true, um, so the theorem that I put up about the image of the moment map being convex is stronger than that. It tells you, um, in fact, that the um, that the the topology that the the Morse the well, sorry. It says that the components of the moment map can be used as Morse functions on the manifold you started with. So that at least tells you it gives you some idea of how many vertices the two polytopes can have. I mean, neither can have very many more than the other. Um, but what exactly the relationship is, I don't think we can say in general. Oh, here's a, another example that just shows up, and it's, I thought it was just interesting to say because this, again, has these two edges crossing that um, don't intersect with the vertex. And everything that I've put up already comes from something Kähler, namely something that has a complex structure, so from a manifold of the complex structure. Um, this is just some weird example. Um, the edges don't have to meet at a vertex. And the reason it's not Kähler, um, you can sort of, well, maybe this isn't uh, terribly interesting, but if you, have, if you have a Kähler manifold, then you can extend an S1 action to a C star action, and you can look at um, the image of a C star orbit. And those images should be convex because we still have this convexity theorem. But if you sort of look, um, if you look at the polytope and you can see on the polytope where the where some orbit should have to be, you can find some non-convex region, which would have to be the image of a of this C star action. And so you can therefore conclude that the, the thing is not 
Taylor. So I guess this is one of the kinds of things that you can prove, you know, just strictly in terms of combinatorics about the manifolds that are lurking in the background. I don't think so. Okay, so now I have to, so I've told you what the moment map is, now I have to tell you what I mean by chambers. So the chambers of the moment polytope are the open regions when I take my moment polytope and take out the biggest dimensional faces, take out the n minus one facets. And so you might ask the following questions, how many chambers are there? Can you put a bound on the number of chambers? And do you have some way to distinguish the chambers? Is there some invariant that you can define for every point in a chamber that's constant on the chamber and is different for points in different chambers? So a partial answer to one. Well, for, for these permutahedra, which are sort of a nice class of examples, well, in dimension two, we can count them easily. And there's one, seven, six, seven, one, and zero if we just have a point. Um, that seems, you know, it seems um, it, the question is sort of how generically we chose our point in RN to permute around. Um, that's going to happen generally. You know, it depends. It's, you're not always going to have just one answer. Um, in R3, uh, Sarah Billy, Victor Gilliman, and Etienne Rassart worked on this problem, and they've found some partial answers. So generic permutahedron, and by generic, for the R2 case, I would mean one of the permutahedra that has seven regions. So they showed that one of the generic ones has 213, but actually there's several different kinds of generic ones in three dimensions. So a generic permutahedron in R3 could have 213, 229, 261, 277, 325, or 337 chambers. So that was a surprise to the symplectic geometers we until they told us this, assumed that they all had the same number. And also we thought that the number was much more like 100. So this was surprising. Um, they worked on the same question for R4, for the four-dimensional ones. Um, that's really hard. We think that they don't even know the order of magnitude. The computer program that they have to count this runs for weeks, I think, just to do the computations for, for R3. So it's hard. So... Oh, yes, so this is in this is in R2, so this is for SV3, so then going up one dimension. Um, I, I was silly and left something in the car. Oh, I see, because when you gave us this example, you said it's in R2, but that was the Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, right, yes, yeah, so really I mean points in R4, so I'm one dimension down. What these look like, um, Good. But so it's a, it's really has a name. I have no idea. It's um, it's um, uh, I've very badly mangled this. I can usually draw it better, but I've drawn it very poorly. Um, it's it's it has the faces that it has. It's well, basically take a tetrahedron, uh, truncate the vertices and bevel the edges simultaneously, and so you. The, on the outside, you have hexagons and squares. And the hexagons are all going to be hexagons that have those extra edges. And then inside, you'll have some parallel some, some facets that are parallel to those. And you'll have some facets parallel to the squares. The squares are just squares. Huh. For generic ones, yes. This is the complete list. Um, 
The other thing is the you can um, because these are all co corresponding to cohedron orbits. Um, each cohedron orbit meets the positive vial chamber exactly once, and so the positive vial chamber is broken up into regions on which the number of chambers is constant, and they you know have the they have the whole list for every element of the positive vial chamber. Okay, so the answer to number two, so the second question was, how can we distinguish the chambers? Um, and this requires a little bit more symplectic geometry. Um, so the, the answer that we come up with, I mean, we come up with some invariant that looks reasonably combinatorial at the end of the day, although actually defining it requires going back to symplectic geometry and back to algebraic topology. So the idea is that I'm going to associate an ideal to each element in a chamber, and then I'm going to show, then we show that the ideals are the same if and only if the two points are in the same chamber. Are easy enough. Okay. And the idea is that there's there's uh, the idea, the reason that this is really a combinatorial answer at the end is that the combinatorics of the moment polytope really um, plays well with the topology, the equivariant topology of M and the torus action. So what do I mean by topology of M and T? What I mean, one thing I might mean by that is understanding the equivariant cohomology ring H T star of M. I should tell you what that is. And actually, I don't really want to tell you what that is because it's not particularly enlightening and it's not. Um, but I do want to tell you about some properties. So it's just some ring that encodes information about M and the T action. It behaves like cohomology. Um, it, oh yeah, if the torus action is free, then it's just the cohomology of the orbit space. Now, of course, all the examples that I showed you, I told you had fixed points. So they're very much not free. Um, so that's not very useful. And that's, that's true. So it's a generalized cohomology theory in the equivariant category. That's a lot of words. Um, cohomology theory means that it should satisfy things like the Meyer Viator. It should have Meyer Viator sequences. And it should have, if you have a map between two spaces, then you should get a map the other way in cohomology. Well, that's true. But I have to work in the equivariant category. So if I have a map between two spaces, that's going to give me a map backwards only if the map is an equivariant map. That's reasonable. Um, and then generalized cohomology theory means that equivariant cohomology of a point is something funny. So ordinarily, cohomology of a point is just a copy of your coefficient ring. Um, in this case, the cohomology of a point is a polynomial ring uh, with n generators, where n is the dimension of the torus, and each of the generators is in degree 2. So cohomology, equivariant cohomology is really big. That's the bottom line. Um, and it's, it's somehow much richer. It's a funny place for a period. It's much richer than um, than ordinary cohomology. So that's all that I want to say about it. But I want to say more in the symplectic category. So the first theorem is: suppose I have a Hamiltonian torus action, and I look at the inclusion of the fixed points into the manifold. That's a perfectly good equivariant map. And so since I have an equivariant map, I should have a map the other way in cohomology. So I do. And the theorem is that that map is an injection. So um, this is useful because in all the examples, um, the set of fixed points is just a set of isolated points. And I told you that the cohomology, the equivariant cohomology of a point is just a polynomial ring. So this tells me that equivariant cohomology is some subring of a bunch of polynomial rings. So one question you might ask is how to figure out exactly which ring. It turns out that in all the examples I've shown you, you can find a very nice combinatorial description as to which subring it is. So. And so all that description depends on is um, is the moment polytope. I mean, it depends on the the one skeleton of the moment polytope, so the vertices and the edges, and exactly where the edges land inside our end, so the the vectors that the that the edges lie on. Okay, so that gets us going. 
And then the second theorem is the following. Suppose that I have a Hamiltonian action and I have some element of a chamber. If I look at phi inverse of mu, I told you that phi was an equivariant map. So phi inverse of mu is going to be an invariant subset. So that inclusion is going to be um, an equivariant map. So I get a map backwards in cohomology. And the theorem is that that map is a surjection. So from the equivariant cohomology of M, which is something that I can combinatorially, combinatorially describe in terms of the moment polytope, surjects onto um, the equivariant cohomology of phi inverse of mu. And so that's exactly where my ideal is going to be. Um, to answer question, to answer the second question, we let our um, our ideal be the kernel of this map. So suppose a torus is acting on M, and I have to we have to assume isolated fixed points. Um, that's just because it's easier to compute when you have isolated fixed points for reasons that I've shown you. So if I have two elements of chambers, then the kernels of the two surjections are the same, actually equal, not just isomorphic, but equal, if and only if mu1 and mu2 are in the same chamber. So that's sort of a nice fact. And um, this doesn't sort of on the face of it seem very combinatorial, but I've already told you that this has a nice combinatorial description. And in fact, the, the kernel has a nice combinatorial description in terms of the polytope as well. So I can write down a list of generators, just I can show you the polytope. Um, given a point, you can just say combinatorially exactly what the generator should be. And so this, this does, you know, although it uses symplectic geometry, turn out to be a combinatorial invariant. Um, and so to give you examples, um, suppose I look at this permutahedron and I want to distinguish the middle chamber from one of the outside chambers. Um, from from you to heater, it turns out that the, um, the, the ideals for these are, are all generated by permuted Schubert polynomials. So these are things that come up in Schubert calculus and equivariant Schubert calculus. Um, in this example, if we want to distinguish those two particular chambers, um, so equivariant Schubert, uh, sorry, permuted Schubert polynomials are just classes that are supported on permuted Schubert varieties. And so I can picture them uh, sort of combinatorially. I have some class that I think of as supported on the red shaded area. And that's going to be a class that's in the kernel for the point in the middle region and not in the kernel for the class that's in the in any of the red shaded regions. And then same thing on this side. I get something that is in the kernel for a point up here and not in the kernel for the point in the middle. So um, that's the story for those. And I should say one word about the proof. Because I have all these combinatorial descriptions floating around, um, it's easy to show, just because the combinatorics is what it is, it's easy to show that the two kernels are the same if mu1 and mu2 are in the same chamber. So that's the easy part of the theorem. The hard part is showing that they're different if they're in different chambers. And the reason that it's particularly hard is because the description of the, of the kernel is just in terms of generators. So we just have a list of generators for each kernel. And saying that, well, this generator is on this list and not on that list isn't really good enough because whatever generates over here might include that generator even if it's not on the list. So we have to do some work to, to show that direction. That's right. And sort of geometrically what's going on, um, so the kernel, I mean, this is just the kernel of the surjection, and the reason that I commented that if T acts freely, then you can pull it in and take a quotient. Um, if mu is an element of one of the chambers, then T is in fact acting freely on phi inverse of mu. So this this right-hand term, the equivariant cohomology of phi inverse of mu, is actually um, the ordinary cohomology of something, and in fact it's it's something that comes up in symplectic geometry. It's a it's a symplectic reduction, which is the same as a GIT quotient. Uh, if you know about that. So, geometric invariant theory. So you can take quotients algebraically. Um, and it turns out to be the same. So that's where I can stop.
That's right. Yeah, I mean, you don't have a moment map anymore, even you don't have a polytope. So. Right, then, of course, that can't be a theorem, but maybe if you well, Mm-hmm. That's possible. Certainly, um, so, so I didn't exactly tell you all the hypotheses on M that you need, but this is more or less, I mean, this is true whenever M is compact or you have some nice assumptions on your moment now. Um, when the action is just symplectic, I'm not exactly sure um, what you can say. There are there are other situations where you you have something like a moment map, um, but the map is not surjective. However, you can identify the co-kernel, so it's almost as good. Um, but these that's certainly a flavor of things that geometers think about. Mm-hmm. Well, there. So that particular computation. I mean, their work is is more focused. So one of the things that I didn't say. One of the reasons people are interested in the chambers, and in particular in that example, um, if if you look at the permutahedron. Um, you can, it, there are sort of, there are um, weight multiplicity formulas coming from representation theory that um, if, if you have an, in this case, these are cogenormants of SUN, so you're looking at a, an SUN representation and looking at, at weight multiplicities, and there's, there's some nice relationship um, between the polytope and these weight multiplicity formulas. And in particular, the chambers of the polytope um, there's sort of some nice formulas that are piecewise polynomial, and the pieces on which they're actually polynomial are the chambers of the polytope. And so their work is, is geared at understanding, at giving nice formulas for those. Um, that particular computation, I think, was just a, a you know, put it, you know, define the, define the polytope, and you know what the facets are because you geometrically know what they should be, and then, you know, have a computer count for you. And I think count by, by um, you know, throw a whole bunch of points randomly into the polytope and count how many different sides of hyperplanes are on or something.